right, Colossians chapter 3. All right, the title of my message this morning is Put Off the Old Man and Put On the New Man. Put Off and Put On. And we're going to learn about some of the things that the Bible talks about in Colossians chapter 3, some of the things we should put off and some of the things that we should put on. And let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we love you. We come before you as a family. Lord, we love the Bible and we want to learn from the Bible and we want to hear from you. We ask you to bless us as a family here today, Lord, uh, for being here. We want to hear from heaven. So we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians is one of my favorite books in the Bible. And I'm not exactly sure why, but when I first got saved, I was, I was wanting to memorize a book of the Bible. And uh, I was having a really hard time picking which book should I memorize. And so after some prayer and after some studying, I zeroed in on Colossians. And I can't quote the whole thing now because I, was, I wasn't good at repeating it over and over and over like you should. But I still have great portions of the book memorized. But one thing in the book that really stuck out on me is Colossians chapter 3. There's just a lot of great teaching in this. And what I like to do um, when, uh, when, when, I'm, when, when people ask me questions about you know, the Christian life, a lot of times I find myself going to Colossians chapter 3. Those verses that have stuck with me. And I like to share some thoughts from from this great passage of the Bible. Um, So let's start reading in Colossians 3 and verse 1. The Bible says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. So these first four verses that introduce us to um, Colossians chapter 3, there's it, it, some fascinating things there. You know, first, first it says, if ye, that's talking to believers. You know, the Bible primarily is written to us. It's written to people who already believe the Bible. And here the Bible says, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. You know, I remember there's been times in my life where I was just like, how do I seek those things are above? How do I set my affections on things above? I mean, it was an honest and sincere question that I had because, you know, I'm kind of an all or nothing guy. I'm always, I always have these interests and these hobbies. And boy, when I get on board with something, whether it be music or skateboarding or, or motorcycles or all these other things that I like to get into, and I could talk a lot about the different things that, 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 that are my interests, I, I get on board with that things and I'm all in. And those are the things that the world has to offer for the most part. And so I, I remember asking God, how do I set my affection on things above, not on things on the earth? I mean, that was just an honest, sincere question that I had because I want to do right. You know, the number one answer I could give you quickly is just spend time in the Bible. That's, that's really what it is. That's the, that's the main way to answer this. But God does give us some, some great um, teaching in this passage, how we can set our affections on things above. And now look at verse 4, which says, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear... Now, if you ask my family, they'll, they'll tell you for the last four, four or five years, I have been focusing primarily in my time with the Lord, studying the end times and Bible prophecy. And like I said, when I get into something, I'm all, I'm all on board. And one of the reasons why that I, I've been focusing on the end times is because for, for almost 20 years of my Christian life, I actually neglected it. You know, I come from a, a great church that was a soul winning church, but... Revelation and prophecy and the second coming Christ where it was, was, was emphasized very little. But look what this verse says right here. It says, when Christ who is our life shall appear. When I started studying prophecy, I, man, the second coming just started jumping out at me all through the Bible. And here we have a verse right here in Colossians. It's talking about the second coming. The second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we're going to appear with Him in glory also. That is when we're going to be resurrected. All right. So because of these things, look what it says in verse 5. 
Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Mortify, it's just a, it's a word that means kill, destroy, mortify. Like a mortician, he's working with dead. You know, mortify your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Now, as a believer, this list that was just given here, we don't struggle with the things in this list very much. I mean, maybe some people do. But, you know, for the most part, when we get saved, we're, we're not struggling with fornication and inordinate affection and, 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 and some of these things. But look what it says. It's interesting in verse 4, it talks about Jesus Christ is coming. Okay, In verse 5, it's talking about Let's do some things and avoid these things because in verse 6 it says, for which things sake the wrath of God. And you know, like I said, I've been studying the end times and this isn't really a prophetic passage, but it's interesting to me that the sequence of events in the end times is there's going to be Jesus' coming and subsequent to His coming, there's going to be the wrath of God is going to be poured out on mankind. So we have that um, that chronology that's taken place there. Jesus is coming. Subsequent to that, there's going to be wrath. We're not going to be part of that wrath. But I promise you, if you come tonight, you are absolutely going to learn some fascinating things. Not that I'm anybody, but I have been studying the book of Revelation for a long time, and we're going to get more into that. I just wanted to give you a little bit of a primer on, on some of the things that we're going to be talking about this evening. So anyway, mortify therefore your members upon the earth. Fornication is the first on the list. Okay, now, I was, I was reached for Christ in a church that preached hard on sin, okay? And Brother Howes, uh, uh, Jack Howes was my preacher, and I remember he would preach hard, and he would say, but you know, the honest truth is, and I don't want to sound too critical of the ministries I've been in there uh, since Brother Howes passed away, but I don't hear preachers preach hard on sin. Like this passage is saying, kill it! Kill the members of your body that would lead you to cause fornication. Fornication is a word that God puts in a lot of different lists where he says, you know, there's not many places in the Bible that says, if you do this, then I'm going to judge you. You know, am I right? God is long suffering. He's patient. He's forbearing. He's merciful. But God says, hey, listen, if you commit fornication or adultery, I'm going to judge you. Like, for instance, in Hebrews chapter 13, it says marriage is honorable in all and the, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. And so, you know, I'm reading verse by verse through this passage because, you know, I wouldn't have chose to say, hey, I'm going to get on fornication right here. But you know what? When we just read the Bible verse by verse by verse, God's going to be telling us things that we need to know. And right here we see this word fornication. And I think that Satan's attack on our youth is to get the youth to commit fornication. And it's, it saddens me because I see it when I go out soul winning, when I go, you know, just... In, in daily life, you go around and you see these young kids, they're, 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 they're actually doing things in public where you know they're doing fornication behind closed doors. And I'm here just to tell you, young people, or anybody here, look, if you're not married, God does not want you to touch another person in that way until the day you get married. Do not commit fornication. God's judgment is harsh on this. I could take you to Revelation chapter 2 where there was a woman in the church committing fornication and adultery with the, pe with the people in the church and God was merciful with her. And he said, look, I gave her space to repent, but she did not. And what did he do? He cast her into a bed of tribulation with them that she committed fornication with. And then he went on to say, I killed her children with death. So this message is not about fornication, but it's interesting how when you read the Bible... You're going you're gonna to get hit on all these different things that we need to know. So, believers, for the most part, don't struggle with the things in this list. But here's where the rubber hits the road. Jump down to verse 8. But now ye put off 
What are we doing? We're putting off the old man. Okay, the things that are natural to us before we get saved, the first list, five things we don't struggle with just as much, but look at these next ones. Put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. I'm surprised my wife wasn't saying amen on that anger one because, you know, <laughs> it's funny. Um, it's not too funny for me, but, you know, my pastor was getting on uh, losing your temper in church. What was it? Just last Wednesday or yeah, I think it was last Wednesday. And uh, he was talking about, you know, how many of you guys out there, you know, lose your temper while you're driving? And my son, Javen, over here, he's like turning around looking at his dad. I was sitting right behind. I was like, hey, remind me, I never gave you a spanking for that either. So, yeah, yeah. So anyway, I haven't arrived yet, folks. I, I talk to traffic a little bit harsher than I should and I make light of it. But honestly, that's an area where. Me, I'm a Baptist preacher. I love to go soul winning. I love to grow in Christ. I love to read the Bible. But you know what? The Bible is telling Tom Black right now, put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication. And you know which one you guys are guilty of. But these are, these are some sins that Christians, I think, are struggling with more than the first list. You know, Most of the people in this room aren't going to go commit fornication when you go in for lunch. You know, But... There's a chance if we don't watch it that we're going to get angry, have wrath, malice. What does malice mean? It means to hurt people. It means to have the desire to hurt somebody. All right, now let's jump down to verse 9. It says, lie not to one another. You know, it's the interesting thing about me, you know, since I'm not a fiction guy. I, I've been studying since, since I got saved. Um, I'm a reader and I love to read about conspiracies and all these different things in the world that, you know, I'm one of those guys, you know what I mean? We're like, here, oh, here comes Tom Black, you know, because I like to talk about the lies of other men. And God's given me the ability to, um, to, to with discernment. If you spend a lot of time in this book, you know, it's interesting. God reveals lies that other people tell. Right here it says, lie not to one another, seeing you have put off. you putting off the old man with his deeds. And this thing of lying right here, I think, is the number one thing that actually Christians struggle with. You know, everybody lies. I catch myself sometimes lying on accident, and then afterwards you're like, oh man, that really wasn't true what I said. But... Um, we need to put off these things. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not to one another. Boy, man, this, this stuff right here could actually, I mean, could help every single one of us grow. Get to that next level in, in, in Christianity, if you will. God hates lies. I mean, he, uh, he mentioned it in the, as in the seven abominations in, in, in Proverbs. And... Um, and so let me mention this as well. You know, all these lists of the different sins that, um, that, that we just read about, another, another peculiarity about me is that uh, I, I feel like Tom Black has damaged goods because of the media and Hollywood and the TV set. Um, more than that, though, but I think the, the, the significant damage to me in my life has come from the mass media. And if you look through this list, fornication, uncleanness, and you go all the way down to lies, it's almost like it's a list that Satan is actually using in the Bible to put in every single movie and TV program and, and, and in the music that we listen to and that we shouldn't be listening to, I should say. It's like you're not gonna you're not gonna hear a movie. Like for instance, one of my one of my friends was saying, Well, I only watch the old movie, so I remember I put on YouTube and I typed in some movie I never even heard of from like the nineteen thirties or forties. And and it was fascinating to me. It was this old black and white movie. It looked like there was a bunch of Baptists in it. You know, their ladies were dressed like ladies, or the guy had a suit and tie on. But what was going on was in this particular movie is that as the woman was very mad 
And she was talking to her friend. You know what she said? She said, I'm just not going to stand for this. I'm not putting up with it anymore. I'm going to leave my husband. Now, back in the 1940s, divorce was a lot less popular than it is now. I just said, you know what? Satan's fingerprints are all over this filthy show, you know? That show that played in the 1940s has put that thought and planted that seed in the mind of countless hundreds or thousands of women. You know, that show wasn't saying, you know, I'm just going to figure it out. I'm going to stick by my husband. You know what? I'm just going to make it work. That's not Satan's message. Satan is using this list with the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedient as the bullet points that you're going to find in all the TV programs. Murder, fornication, lies. I mean, I remember I used to watch sitcoms way back in the 80s. And, you know, sometimes the whole sitcom was based on a lie. And then, and then one person didn't know the lie, but the whole rest of the pro- people in the program knew the lie. And they made a big fun funny joke out of the fact and then this guy's oblivious to whatever the lie is and then they make a big and the bible says fools make mock at sin and that's what's going on folks and and you know i i really have a hard time with the media and tv and hollywood and everything and you know if 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 these programs if you turned on the program and it was like you didn't have to go to public school and you're learning how to do math and you're learning the Bible and you're doing all these things, I'd be, I'd be up here preaching, hey, let's turn on your TVs, people. But you know what? That's not happening. The media and the world is turning our children, I've seen it with my own eyes, into sodomites. Yeah. It's what's going on now. I cannot stomach these shows anymore. I threw TV out of my life a long time ago, but you know what? Back in the 80s when I used to watch that stuff, there was a show called Three's Company, and it was like there weren't queers on a TV set back then, but there was a guy pretending to be a queer because he was shacking up with a couple girls. You know, but now it seems like when I was studying you know, for messages you know, here and there, it's like every single TV show has a queer in it. And so anyway... Folks, I just wanted to spend some time on these things that we're supposed to put off. The devil is focusing on these very things with media and Hollywood and promoting them. Murder, fornication, take revenge. I mean, revenge. Let's all get revenge for somebody. You know, is that a a biblical? Is that fruit of the Spirit? It absolutely is not. And so, folks, I I would admonish you to put off the old man. The Bible says to put off the old man with his deeds. Maybe that means putting off the TV set, putting off Hollywood. All right, so this is Sunday morning. We're supposed to, we're supposed to be nice, right? All right, let's, let's move on from, uh, from that. Whoa, wait a minute. Oh, look at verse 11. Now, this is another interesting thing about the Bible. God stuck this verse in here. Seemingly, it has nothing to do with lie not to one another. But listen to this, what it says. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Here is a major New Testament teaching that is completely ignored in almost all independent Baptist churches. A major teaching right here in this verse. The Bible says... In New Testament, this is the New Testament, right? The New Covenant? Well, anyway, there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. What does that mean? That means, you know, this morning if you were here, you would have heard the story about how prophecy is one of the proofs for the Bible. And Jesus Christ prophesied that there was going to come a day where the Romans would encompass all around Israel or Jerusalem and raise it down to the ground, destroy it, not one stone left upon another. We are in New Testament Bible Christianity. That prophecy was fulfilled. Now the Bible says there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. Romans chapter 10 says exactly that. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. And I'd like to show you guys something. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. 
you know, in the late 90s, I was, uh, like I said, I could get all into things, and I was a very big fanboy. Okay, if, I don't know if you've ever heard that term before, but a fanboy. Like I, my dad raised me to love Chevys and Fords. They were just, I don't know, found on road dead, you know. So I'm a Ford, I mean, I'm a Chevy guy, and just because I was a fanboy. And, and when, after I got saved in 92, in the late 90s, I was a big-time fanboy for Israel. Why? Because... The preaching that I was getting was exalting Israel and saying all these things. But here in Colossians chapter 3, it says, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision. And now, so let's go to Galatians chapter 3, like I said. Now, finish up my point here. Bear with me a second here. So when I started coming to terms with with Israel, and I used to read the Jerusalem Post every single day in the late 90s when I was a programmer. You know, I was behind the desk all the time. And when I'd get a break in the action, I would be on jpost.com and Haaretz newspaper. And I knew the goings on in Israel as much as people that live there. I quit reading the American press because I thought it was a bunch of lies. And, and, uh, and so, but I was a fanboy for Israel. And then, you know, I... You know, without even getting scriptures on this, I started realizing that the people in Israel and the Jews in Chicago and the, and, and the different parts of New York and different parts of the country, they are exceedingly anti-Bible. They are exceedingly democratic. They are pro-abortion. They are pro-big corporations. They are pro-big government. They are against the family and all the legislations that they do. And so I'm reading the Jerusalem Post, you know, just exalting the Jews in my mind because they're God's chosen people I was hearing over and over and over. And I'm like, man, what? I just can't reconcile this. And so about 17 years ago, 2000, 2001, something, somewhere in there, I was like, I, I quit cold turkey reading that because of some things that I won't get into. I just realized that, hey, these, these so-called Jews that dominate politics, they dominate the banking industry, and they dominate the corporations. These, these people are not Jews. They're Jews that say they are Jews and are not, but do lie, but are the synagogue of Satan. And so, but anyway, that's not the lesson. That was just a bonus. Let's turn to uh, Galatians chapter 3 here. And look at verse 28. Again, the same point that we're finding in Colossians. It says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Look what it says then. And if ye be Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So folks, let me tell you, God doesn't look at Jews and Gentiles anymore. We're all one in Christ. You know? And so... I wanted to park there a little bit because Colossians just happens to mention the fact in this long list of sins, put off the old man. He's saying, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision. And so there's a lot more to that subject. And I wish I could just go on and on and on and on about it. But like I said, because I was a fanboy, I was big time into it. It was like the pendulum swung the other way. And so now I feel compelled to share some of those things because I do think it's causing a lot of damage. Um, and we'll find out a little bit more about that tonight, the damage specifically that it's causing by exalting a nation that people say are God's chosen people where these are absolutely not. You know, an interesting thing about the people that live in Israel right now, they're not even of the seed of Shem. They are of the seed of Japheth. You know, Japheth, he's the Europeans. And anyway, well, I'll, uh, I'll move on from there. So let's, um, let's look at verse... Number 12, put on, all right, put on. I, I looked up that phrase put on and put off, and you know in the Bible you search for that phrase put on. It's found a whole bunch of times, dozens of times actually, and most of the time it's talked about putting on and putting off a garment. And so God is telling us to put off the old man, anger, wrath, malice, and blasphemy, and all these other things, and lying. Put those things on, but look, he's telling us to put on some things. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God. See, folks, we're the elect of God. 
Like I was just talking about, you know, Gentiles and Jews before, and some people will tell you that, well, the Jews, you know, they're the elect, Brother Tom. Well, no, right here it says, put on therefore as the elect of God. We're the elect of God. Holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long-suffering. I want to get through this point real quick because, you know, the honest truth is I'm not known for many of these. <laughs> but, you know, it is Sunday morning and, and, and we like to hear some, some things that are really good that we should do. So let's put on, as the elect of God, Holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness and long suffering. So who can stand up and say, hey, I watched a movie that taught me to have long suffering and humbleness of mind. This is the list Satan's avoiding in, 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 in his massive media empire. You know, nobody's learning bowels of mercies. Nobody's learning any kindness. When you turn on that show, you're going to hear a bunch of filthy language. You're going to see maybe some nudity or some promiscuity. You're going to see fornication. You're going to see all these things in here. But look, the Bible says put these things on. Bowels of mercy, humbleness of mind. Verse 13, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. Wow, there's another absent Topic in a Hollywood movie, hey, let's forgive. And you know, honestly, this is one, one thing that I had a big problem with in life is forgiving. And I think the day that I, that I could look back to where I honestly do not have a bitter grunch against one person in the world, there's growth that took place in my life there. Now, you know, of course, I still need to be working on it because if you revisit the matter, well, this person did this to me, you know, you could get yourself worked up. But honestly, folks, this verse right here is one of the verses, I think, that if you really want to have true revival in your life and growth as a Christian, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. That word forbearing, it's kind of not, it's not used a whole lot anymore. It just means to put up. It means to endure. You know, there's people that we don't really get along with that well because, you know, maybe there's not a chemistry there or what have you. The Bible says, forbear one another. Forgive one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, here's why. Even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. You know, that person that made you so mad and I can't believe he did this. I guarantee you could think of something that you did that was worse than that. And Jesus Christ forgave you for it. You know, and when you're mad at that person, you're not thinking about when you did the exact same thing or something close to it to somebody else. Most of the time, you know, and there are people out there that that just don't get it. And they're exceeding and they do things that are wrong. And maybe you were completely and unjustly wronged by somebody. But hey, God tells us right here. I mean, he's telling us the formula how to put on the new man. And right here, it's being summarized with one of the best verses how to do it. It's forbear and to forgive. Boy, that's, that's mature Christianity right there. And look, look at verse 14. And above all things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. That word perfect, it, it means mature. It means complete. It doesn't mean sinless. So this word charity, is, it's an interesting word. And I've heard it taught on so many times. You know, I remember Brother Howes, he used to preach. Yeah, it's, uh, charity, is, is, it's a verb. It's love in action. And I think that's, that's pretty close to, to what that word means. Um, so... If, um, if you have charity, you can prove it by putting on the elect of God as the elect of God, bowels of mercies, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. And above all these things, put on charity. Charity is, is loving somebody to the point where you're going to do something for them 
not expecting anything in return. But it's, it's a verb. It's, a, it's an action. This is good stuff, folks, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, like I said, I'm, my, my wife, she's probably saying, yeah, yeah, park there a while. Because <laughs> we all need these things, folks. Verse 15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Being thankful, here's another thing we need to put on. You know, put off all these things. The old man, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, lying not. But God's telling us some great things to put on. And once again, being thankful is not a theme you're going to find in too many Hollywood movies. You know, when they're emptying out of the theater and people are coming out, you're saying, hey, it was a good money. Yeah, we're, good. we're just so thankful. That movie just taught us to be so thankful. So gratitude, folks. The world, the world did not teach me to be grateful. The world did not teach me to be thankful. But you know, the book of Colossians, this great book, this great chapter that will help us. It'll help marriages. It'll help families. It'll help relationships. It'll help the believer. How to overcome the old man. Let's put on being thankful. Look at verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So this verse right here, it's telling us to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. You know, it's impossible to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Unless you read it. So here, here's an admonition. You know, Colossians chapter 3, it's just loaded with good things. And, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll tell people, you know, they're having a hard time in life. Hey, get in Colossians chapter 3. Hang on every word. Read every single verse. Every single verse is just packed with information. Packed with good instruction. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. What does that mean? It means read it. It means listen to preaching. It means to memorize it. You know, I was a pretty rough guy before I got saved, and there's still evidence of that in my life right now. If you follow me around with a camera, I guarantee you're going to see some things. Wow, Brother Tom, man. Yeah, well, you need some improvement in this area. But let me tell you this. I was able to overcome a lot of that stuff because I got in the Bible, and I obeyed this. I started memorizing Scripture. I was listening to preaching. I mean, hours a day because, man, I needed more help than the average guy. I was running around in Chicago Heights with um, a lot of people. And I, I joke often saying, I wasn't the guy that you wanted your daughter to marry. You know? But the transforming power of the, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, um, I'm, I'm proof and evidence that the gospel works. And so, look what it says in the second half of that verse. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You know what, folks? Been saved for 24 years. I've been around a lot of believers. And this part of their Christianity, of people that I've been around, is absent. You know what? Because when you get in their car and you hit the eject button or, or whatever they got nowadays, they don't have CDs, or you just turn on the radio, it's on the country and western station. Or it's on the goodies, the oldies but goodies. Or it's fill in the blank. And you know what? I'm nothing special, but when I got saved, I used to live for that music. I was, I, I mean, that's, that's what I love. That was the idolatry in my life was music. And when I got saved, I was in a soul winning environment and I wanted to be a soul winner. And I knew a couple things had to happen for God to use me. One of them was I had to cut my hair. You know, if you're going to be a witness for Christ, you can't look like I did, all right? And then the second thing is I had to eliminate the thing that I loved most in my life. And that was, that was rock music. I mean, rock music, it's not neutral stuff. It's just not. It's not like happy birthday to you, no Jesus in it, but you know, it's not satanic either. The stuff that I was listening to was filled with spiritual weakness and abominable things. I mean, wicked stuff. They were proclaiming loudly and boldly that Jesus Christ was not their God. I could tell you some of the lyrics and some of the songs I used to listen to. Filthy, abominable trash, but you know what? That's all I loved. 
My brother's here. He drove all the way from Chicago to hear me this morning. He could testify. I was all things about this music. And it's an amazing miracle of God that you could search my car, my house for the last 24 years and you never find that stuff in my life. God helped me with that. And you know what? I didn't know I could tell you just a real quick story about how I was able to overcome it. I knew God didn't like it and I loved it. It was a dilemma. So how do you overcome it? I went to God and I said, God, this is all I know and it's all that I love. I don't want to give it up. But I I said, God, I give you permission to take it from me. I'm not saying that's like the best scriptural advice to give anybody, but that's what I did. And I'm telling you, God showed me the the devils that were in that music while I was sleeping. It was a pretty, pretty crazy uh, situation. I saw the devils that were behind the music that I was listening to. And you know what? That stuff was gone. I was like, I don't want any part of that stuff. It's a pretty spooky story. I won't get into the details. But I promise you, I saw devils from another world. And it was the same devils that were in the posters of the rock, the rock bands that I used to have on my wall. And so, um, thank God he was able to do spiritual surgery on me. And now my flesh, it still likes it. It still wants to listen to it. But you know what? That music is the enemy of the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel of righteousness. It absolutely is. And so, I wanted to mention that thing because it does sadden me that um, a lot of Bible-believing Christians who love God, man, they're they're just playing around with Satan's domain. You know, they've got... You know, the Netflix thing's going. It's filled with rock music and filled with things that aren't in the, on the put-on list. It's filled with the things put on the put-off-the-old-man list. And, and the music's a big one. And it was the biggest one in my life. And thank God I was able to overcome that. All right, verse 17. We're on the home stretch here, folks. Verse 17, it says, Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. You know what? I've, I talk to people, you know, and you know, I, I, I'm kind of a preachy guy a little bit. You know, and I've had, I've had people tell me, whether it's out soul winning or friends or something, you can't show me a verse in the Bible that says I can't smoke or I can't listen to my rock music or I can't do fill in the blank. And I, I, I go to this verse right here. It says, Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Can you give God thanks for that cigarette you're about to smoke? Can't do it. I mean, not in honesty. Oh, God, thanks for this shot of tequila. <laughs> yeah, I think we got a lion problem there if, you, if you're thinking you give it. Or, or that, that your God has a lowercase g. You know, so honestly, there is scripture in the Bible if somebody's doing drugs. You know, I've had somebody tell me, man, weed's natural, man. You know, you guys heard that before? All right, so um, since my sister-in-law is here, we're going we're gonna to park on this one. Verse 18. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'll, I'll be fast, oh, you ladies. All right, wives, submit yourself unto your own husband. You know, it's another thing about Hollywood. Uh, sorry, I just uh, got to get this Hollywood thing off my chest. I don't get to do this very often, so I'm taking liberty at Liberty Baptist Church while Brother McMurtry's gone. All right, so listen, Hollywood's teaching the ladies of this world that, hey, I don't want to have children. If I do, I'll have one when I'm 40, and I'm definitely not going to submit to my husband. But in the meantime, I'm going to like rise through the ranks and I'm going to be bank president or I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that or I'm going to be fill in the blank. But the Bible says, wives, submit yourself unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. You know, a godly lady, you know, there's a lot of ladies that put me to shame because they're godly women and they should be exalted. And um, praise God for the old days where people didn't get divorced. And ladies, ladies were modest and ladies were godly. And God uses women. You know. And, um, and look what it says here. 
Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. You know, we got to be careful, husbands. We got to be careful to, to love our wives and not to be bitter against them. They're the weaker vessel. Children, obey your parents in some things. No, children, obey your parents in all things. You know, sometimes mom and dads are wrong. You know, and the children, they're smart. They know it. But it doesn't matter. The Bible says, children, obey your parents in all things. Why? For this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. And fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. So let's be careful to do that. And that's my prayer for me as well. I have, I have nine children. And you know what? When they're little, man, it's, good. it's easy to be a dad. You know, but as they continue to get older, they get smarter. They're growing, more independent. They've got responsibilities. And so us dads, we need to be careful. And we need to be praying for our children. And we need to have a good relationship with our children. And be careful not to provoke your children to anger lest they be discouraged. And so quickly, verse 22, the Bible says, Servants, obey in all things, not some things, just like the last verse. Servants obey in all things. Your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers. You know, that just means that you're obeying only because you have a motive to please a man. Or if, or if the boss is around, you're going to work a little harder than when he's not around. Now, that's not what this verse is saying here. This verse is saying, look. But in singleness of heart, fearing God. Verse 23 continues the thought. says, Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. So when we go and we're going to work and we're dealing with somebody who is authority over us, they're in charge. You know, we need to work hard as unto the Lord. You know, God knows that some of our bosses, they're not Christians. They might not even have good decision making, but these people that are put in charge, you know, we need to be careful as a believer to have a good testimony and we need to, we need to do it heartily as to the Lord, not unto men. You know, Colossians chapter 3 has got some good stuff in it, doesn't it? I mean, it's all over the place, man, hitting all of our toes. You know, sometimes I'm like, yeah, this is a great verse. And other times I'm like, man, I don't even have the, the confidence to preach this verse because I'm failing myself. I mean, this is a great chapter. I encourage you guys to all get very familiar with Colossians chapter 3. Look what it says, verse 25. Why? But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. God doesn't say, well, Tom, you know, because you were born in this family and, you know, you weren't trained right. You know what? I mean, God does take those things in consideration. But you know what? I've been in the Bible for 24 years now. I know what I'm supposed to do. and I know the things where I fail. And I'm going to do I'm going to receive for the wrong which I have done. You know, I've heard a lot of people make a mistake and say, you ever hear this? You're going to stand before God one day for your sin. Talking to a believer. And I've said that before when I was really mad. You know what? That's false doctrine. Here's the true doctrine. You're going to receive for the wrong which you've done now. You know what? When you're out so many sometimes, you're talking to other people, they reject the gospel because they're like, oh, you're saying you could just go be a murderer. You know? Or you could go and do whatever you want after you get saved. No, I don't believe that. It's too easy. But you know what? If I killed somebody and I'm God's child, I'm a child of the king, you better believe that God is going to make sure that I'm punished here on this earth. And I think it's going to be worse than the godless heathen that causes the same murder. You know, we all know the story about some preacher who did something and it was exceedingly wicked. And I was telling my children about one of these preachers that I knew. He did something. It was exceedingly wicked. But you know what? We were driving to church that, that day we found out about it. I was like, you see that neighborhood right there? I'm sure there's somebody in that neighborhood that's done something worse. 
We don't even know who they are. I said, but God's child, when he does something wicked, he is going to receive for the wrong which he hath done. And a Christian is definitely held to a, a higher degree of accountability. And so, folks, anyway, I just wanted to read every single verse in Colossians chapter 3. This chapter has really helped me in my Christian life. Um, there's a lot of good stuff. There's, I mean, I've got tons of notes that I didn't even cover. Um, but, hey, we're new believers, some of us. And the Bible says, put off the old man and put on the new man. And there is a lot of things in there that God tells us to put off. And there's a lot of other things God tells us to put on. So let's get familiar with Colossians chapter 3. Amen? Amen. All right, Brother Eric.